Gregor Mendel showed us that truly understanding evolution requires a mathematical approach. And in the early 20th century, two thinkers came up with a mechanism for beginning to wrap their heads around what evolution really is. And what's crazy is, they came up with the same idea at the same time, but they didn't even know the other person existed. This tends to happen more than you'd think in science. These people were an Englishman, G. H. Hardy, and a German, Wilhelm Weinberg. And these two chaps both developed a mathematical model in order to analyze the consequences of when individuals of a population mate. But what was unique about this approach is that they broke from what was known to actually happen in nature. They assumed that all individuals of a population breed. This may seem strange, but sometimes, in order to understand what something is, we have to understand what it isn't. In this mathematical model, Hardy and Weinberg use a gene pool concept. This is the idea that all gametes, that is the sperm and the eggs, can be thought of as a single group. So imagine all the sperm and all the eggs of all the humans on Earth. That is the human gene pool. Kind of crazy to think about. So Hardy and Weinberg also had an assumption about how these gametes interacted. They assumed that all gametes of a gene pool combine randomly. And from the matching of all gametes, they could calculate the predicted frequencies of the ex what the expected genotypes of a new population would look like. Let's see what that looks like. They looked at a single gene within a population. Mendel's work showed us that for a simple gene, there are two alleles. When learning this, we usually show the dominant allele with a capitalized letter and the recessive allele with a lowercase letter. However, we can also identify alleles with subscript. So for a simple population, there are two different alleles, identified in this example as A subscript 1 and A subscript 2. And we'll also talk about them as A sub 1 or A sub 2. They identified the frequency of A sub 1 with the letter P and A sub 2 with the letter Q. So if a population has 40% of its gametes that have the allele A sub 1, that means that their frequency is 40%. So P, by definition, would equal 0.4. And we also know that there are only two possibilities of alleles. So we know that Q would equal 0.6, because P plus Q equals 1. Each gene requires two alleles, and the combination of alleles determines an organism's genotype. Remember, the phenotype is their physical characteristics. The genotype is how the, the alleles come together. And if all the gametes are combining randomly, then we know that the probability of those genotypes and what they should be. They're simply function of the probability of what the gametes are. So, the expected probability of a genotype A sub 1, A sub 1, would simply be the percentage of alleles of A sub 1 in a gene pool times itself. Mathematically, it would be P squared. Likewise, the expected probability of genotype A sub 2, A sub 2, would simply be the percentage of alleles of A sub 2 in the gene pool times itself. In other words, mathematically, it would be Q squared. And the expected probability of the genotype A sub 1, A sub 2, would be the percentage of gametes of A sub 1 multiplied by the percentage of gametes of A sub 2. However, we also have to multiply that number by 2 because there are two possible ways to combine these two gametes, A sub 1 with A sub 2 or A sub 2 with A sub 1. So each population can have three possible genotypes, A sub 1 with another A sub 1, an A sub 1 with an A sub 2, or an A sub 2 with another A sub 2. And individuals can only have one of those genotypes. And since there can only be three possible genotypes, the sum of the probabilities must equal 100%. If you convert that to a number, it equals 1. So you get the equation p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. The first prediction from the Hardy-Weinberg equation is that you should be able to predict the genotype frequency of one generation from the allele frequencies of the parent generation. And we'll see an example of that here in a minute. And the second prediction is that the offspring allele frequencies must be the same as the parental allele frequencies. They argued 
that the allele frequencies don't tend to move towards an even distribution. But also they predict that the dominant alleles also don't tend to increase with, with frequency. Let's see how this works with an example. Suppose a population has an allele frequency of A sub 1 of 70%. Therefore, the allele frequency of A sub 2 has to be 30%. In mathematical terms, P would equal 0 0.7 and Q would equal 0 0.3. If we assume the same frequency for sperm and eggs, the expected genotype of A sub 1, A sub 1 would be P times P, or P squared. So we would expect 0 0.7 times 0 0.7, or 49% of the new generation, to be of the genotype A sub 1, A sub 1. If we repeat the same equation for the probability of A sub 2, A sub 2, we would square Q. 0 0.3 times 0 0.3 equals 9%. So we'd expect 9% of the new population to be of the genotype A sub 2, A sub 2. And since there are two ways to become a sub 1, a sub 2, we have to double the multiplication of p and q. So 2 times p times q suggests that 42% of the offspring generation would have the genotype a sub 1, a sub 2. And since the three genotypes have to add up to 1, we can figure out what p and q are would be for the offspring generation. Mathematically, p squared plus 2pq plus q squared equals 1. To figure out the allele frequencies of the A sub 1 allele in the offspring generation, we have to account for their expected abundance. P squared indicates a genotype with both A sub 1s, so we include that number. Look in the lower left of the slide. This is indicated by the number 0 0.49. That indicates the value of P squared. However, we also have to add the frequencies of alleles in the heterozygotes. And since the heterozygotes include only half of the alleles, we have to divide the total frequencies of heterozygotes in half. So mathematically, we can say that the p of the offspring is equal to the p squared of the parent and half of the 2p of the parent. Likewise, the q of the offspring is equal to q squared of the parent plus one half of the 2pq of the parent. Make sure you understand how to get all these numbers. I suggest rewinding and reviewing this slide a few times until it's clear, and perhaps try it with other examples. You may have noticed in the last example that the allele frequency of the parent generation was exactly the same as the offspring generation, and that is one of the predictions of the Hardy-Weinberg principle. However, if we find that the allele frequencies do change through generations, then prediction 1 and or prediction 2 of the Hardy-Weinberg principle have not been met. And this means that the population is either evolving or the assumptions of random mating have been violated, or possibly both of those. And this is important because now we have a mathematical way of determining whether evolution is actually occurring. In this way, the Hardy-Weinberg principle is used as a null model. It assumes that mating is completely random and that none of the four mechanisms of evolution are happening. If the allele frequencies do change from generation to generation, then one or both of these factors are at work. So what is a null hypothesis? The Hardy-Weinberg principle is important as a null hypothesis. It tells us what to expect if no evolution is occurring and mating is random. If the allele frequencies change from generation to generation, we know something else is at work. There are three types of natural selection, each of which I'll discuss in the subsequent slides. Any trait is variable in a community. Look at human height. There are some people that are short, other people are really tall, eh, but most people are of average height. Directional selection is a case of natural selection in which the frequency of an allele increases because it has a significantly higher fitness than the other one. In this way, disadvantageous alleles are eventually lost. And the classic example of this is the giraffe's neck. It was so advantageous for the ancestors of the modern day giraffes to have longer necks that those individuals with longer necks were more successful in eating and reproducing. That trait was selected for so strongly that their offspring all ended up having longer necks. That is directional selection. 
Directional selection doesn't always select for bigger, faster, and stronger. Sometimes natural selection selects for smaller species, and this is common in islands, and it's actually known as island dwarfism. Islands typically have very limited resources, and many times individuals that are smaller can survive on a smaller amount of food. So those individuals that are smaller are more fit to survive and reproduce. And we've seen this in elephants and chameleons, and even with the human species. Very recently, a fossil of a new species of humans have been discovered in the island of Florence in the southern Pacific. These hominids are so closely related to modern-day humans that some scientists argue that they're not a separate species, but just another variation of Homo sapiens. But regardless of their classification, they exhibit classic island dwarfism and are all a fraction of the total body mass of mainland humans. This is another example of directional selection. Another type of natural selection is stabilizing selection. If you think about the bell curve in terms of the mean or average and variance, the directional selection changes the mean. In stabilizing selection, however, the mean remains more or less the same, whereas the variance changes. This produces future generations with more intermediate traits and fewer extreme traits. A great example of this is human birth weights. Especially before the advent of modern medicine, children that were born with very small birth weights didn't stand a very high chance of survival. They simply didn't have the resources. And on the flip side, you rarely hear of a 12 or 13 pound baby. And the reason is that a 12 pound ba baby stands a good chance of not even making, being able to come through the birth canal. So from an evolutionary perspective, the most fit babies were those with a very specific range of birth weights. This is stabilizing selection. In disruptive selection, the mean also doesn't change, but the variation increases. In this type of natural selection, extreme phenotypes in both directions are more fit than the intermediate ones. And this is thought to be a common cause of speciation, or the formation of new species. One example is of black and white rabbits. Black rabbits are better suited to hide amongst dark rocks to avoid predators, whereas white rabbits are better suited to avoid predators in a snowy environment. So the evolution of rabbit fur has tended to select for rabbits of white fur or very dark fur. Organisms that have intermediate, say, gray fur, are not well suited for each environment and are selected against. This is an example of disruptive selection. Genetic drift is the change in frequency of a gene variant in a population due to random sampling. The alleles in the offspring are a sample of those in the parents, and the chance has a role in determining whether a given individual survives and reproduces. A population's allele frequency is the fraction of the copies of one gene that share a particular form. Genetic drift may cause gene variants to disappear completely and thereby reduce genetic variation. When there are a few copies of an allele, the effect of genetic drift is larger, and when there are many copies, the effect is smaller. The founder effect is a special case of genetic drift, occurring when a small group in a population splinters off from the original population and forms a new one. The new colony may have less genetic variation than the original population, and through the random sampling of alleles during reproduction of subsequent generations, continue rapidly toward fixation. This consequence of inbreeding makes the colony more vulnerable to extinction. When a newly formed colony is small, its founders can strongly affect the population's genetic makeup far into the future. In humans, which have a slow reproduction rate, the population will remain small for many generations, effectively amplifying the drift effect generation after generation until the population reaches a certain size. Alleles that were present, but relatively rare in the pop original population, can move to one of two extremes. The most common one is that the allele is soon lost altogether. But the other possibility is that the allele survives and within a few generations has become much more dispersed throughout the population. The new colony can experience an increase in the frequency of recessive alleles as well, and as a result, an increase of number of people who are homozygous for certain recessive traits. Population bottleneck is an evolutionary event in which a significant percentage of a population or species is killed or otherwise prevented from reproducing. 
Population bottlenecks reduce the genetic variation and therefore the population's ability to adapt to new selective pressures such as climate change or a shift in available resources. And this is a cause of genetic drift, and genetic drift can eliminate alleles that could have posit been positively selected on by the environment if they had not already drifted out of the population. Population bottlenecks increase genetic drift, as the rate of drift is inversely proportional to population size. And the reduction of a population's dispersal leads, over time, to increased genetic homogeneity. If severe, po population bottlenecks can also markedly increase inbreeding due to the reduced pool of possible mates. Gene flow is the transfer of alleles or genes from one population to another. Migration into and out of a population may be responsible for a marked change in allele frequencies the proportion of members carrying a particular variant of a gene. Immigration may also result in the addition of new genetic variants to the established gene pool of a particular species or population. There are a number of factors that affect the rate of gene flow between different populations. One of the most significant factors is mobility, as greater mobility of an individual tends to give it greater migratory potential. Animals tend to be more mobile than plants although pollen and seeds can be carried great distances by animals or wind. Maintained gene flow between two populations can also lead to a combination of the two gene pools, reducing the genetic variation between the two groups. It is for this reason that gene flow acts strongly against speciation by recombining the gene pools of the groups and thus repairing the developing differences in genetic variation that would have led to full speciation and creation of daughter species. While most of the evolutionary mechanisms decrease diversity, mutations are one of the mechanisms that actually increases it. Mutations increase diversity by creating new alleles. More times than not, these mutations lower fitness. However, ever so often, a mutation produces a beneficial allele in an organism's in terms of fitness and over time this allele has a tendency to increase in frequency. And in unicellular organisms, this is the predominant evolutionary force, as they can't have sex. Sexual selection is a special form of natural selection, and it occurs when individuals differ in their ability to attract mates. This has a tendency of producing quite flamboyant characteristics in these species. Hardy and Weinberg ignored this for simplicity of the mathematical model. And why does sexual selection occur? Well, it's argued that since females invest far more into the production of their offspring, that they can be very choosy as to who their mates are. In other words, eggs are expensive, sperm is cheap. So to impress the ladies, gentlemen have to compete amongst themselves to prove that they are indeed the cream of the crop. 